I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Sam Hauser. Dr. Hauser received her postdoctoral training at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, PhD in Evolutionary Biology at University of Louisiana Lafayette, and Bachelor's in Science from Rutgers University. Prior to joining Embark in 2021, she worked in endangered species conservation, using genetics to guide management decisions on a multitude of species, such as the Hawaiian monk seal and the black capped vireo. Of note, she served as a collaborative partner with San Diego Zoo and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in their mission to incorporate genetics into pedigrees to guide breeding decisions in their conservation programs to prevent species extinction. As a conservation geneticist here at Embark, Dr. Hauser sees genetics as an incredibly powerful tool for canine health and breeding. I'm personally looking forward to her presentation today, as this is a topic closely connected to Embark's overall mission and a crucial component of our work with breeders. Please post any questions you have for Dr. Hauser in the chat box. She will answer questions from the audience as part of her live Q&A after her presentation. Welcome, Dr. Sam Hauser. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, before I begin, I wanted to thank the organizers and the committee uh, for this year's em Embark's Canine Health Summit. Um, Embark for bringing so many great speakers on to talk during this summit, and of course, everyone who is listening in today. Today, I'll be talking a bit about inbreeding and why we should consider inbreeding, in particular, genetic COI in breeding decisions. More specifically, I'm going to talk about five uh, major concerns that are common in uh, breeding in the breeding world. Uh, first is what is inbreeding and how do we measure it here in Embark? How do pedigree coefficient of inbreeding and genetic coefficient of inbreeding differ and why is genetic COI valuable? How is genetic COI distributed across different breeds? What is the link between COI and dog health? And what can breeders do moving forward to reduce inbreeding uh, in their lines? Okay, so to start off, we're going to talk a little bit about pedigrees, which I think many of you will be very familiar with. Um, and in this pedigree on the left, this is an idealized um, or typical pedigree that you would think of, in which there are two unrelated lineages, the yellow and the blue, that results in a mating. Um, and that offspring at the bottom uh, has equal representation of both the yellow and blue lineages. Inbreeding, on the other hand, is the production of offspring from the mating of genetically related individuals. And in this inbred pedigree above, instead of there being in distinct and unrelated lines like the yellow and blue on the left, we have a half sibling mating in the center, um, which results in an offspring on the bottom with an overrepresentation of the yellow lineage in it um, that you would not expect based off of um, a typical pedigree on the left. And we can measure inbreeding um, in a pedigree based off of DNA inheritance, where each parent transmits a random half of their DNA to each offspring. And through the pedigree, we can trace those relationships to calculate coefficients of relatedness, R, and inbreeding F, which is also known as the pedigree uh, coefficient of inbreeding, or those who are very familiar with pedigrees, this is pairwise kinship. So if we look at individuals B and C, their relatedness would be one fourth or 0.125, and their resulting offsprings in breeding would be that relatedness divided by two or one eighth, 0.125. But the problem with this is these are calculations represent probabilities, not the realized relatedness or coefficient of inbreeding. And the reason why we see that, um, I'll get to in a second, but we first have to go over some terminology first of which is identical by descent, IBD. And this is when two copies of DNA are identical and inherited from a common ancestor. So if we take this pedigree on the left, uh, the offspring on the bottom can get two copies of yellow DNA, one from mom and one from dad, um, but those ultimately come from the common ancestor, the, the grandmother at the very top. And so those, those copies of DNA that are the same from grandma would be identical by descent, IDD. 
The second term is coefficient of inbreeding, which I've alluded to a little bit so far. And this is the probability from zero to one that a genetic locus is a genetic locus in an individual is IBD. And in the genome, we can measure this as the fraction of the genome that is in IBD. To break this down genetically, let us take the same pedigree um, and look at dog A at the top here. And dog A has two copies of a chromosome, half of which is blue, the other half is purple. And we all know that um, a dog passes on a random half of its genome to its offspring. And so the recombination, the shuffling um, of DNA before it gets uh, transmitted to its offspring, we can have different compositions or mosaics of DNA. So offspring B here has a different composition of DNA than an offspring C on the right. And do that same inheritance and recombination. Dog B can inherit, will pass its DNA on to dog D, and so will dog C. And this area of shared blue on each copy of the chromosome be considered IBD, identical by descent, as it ultimately comes from dog A, the grandmother, all the way at the top. And this IBD is what we're interested in when we're measuring inbreeding. What we're specifically uh, measuring are called runs of homozygosity. These are stretches of chromosome where both copies of an individual's DNA, one from mom and one from dad, are IBD. So if you look at this diagram at the top, you'll see the blue or teal um, block here. And above that are the two copies of a chromosome or the genetic sequence right there. And you'll notice that they are identical on both copies. Um, and this is considered homozygous, um, hence the runs of homozygosity. And we measure these um, to calculate our genetic COI. What we do is we sum, sum up all of the lengths of ROH and we divide it by the total genome size. So visually, this looks like we sum up all the blue blocks um, and divide it by the total genome or all the blue and non-blue segments of the, of the genome. To go back to this example with the pedigree, um, so this, this IBD segment of blue up here at the bottom, based off of the pedigree alone, it would say that the inbreeding for dog D is 1 8th, 1.25. But when we measured based off ROH, um, it was actually 0.13. So this takes us to our first take home um, point, which is that pedigree based UI is a probability. It does not account for specific genetic recombination events within a dog's pedigree. Now, to take this example one step further, instead of considering one offspring, what if we considered a whole litter of five offspring. Now, of course, the pedigree COI would say that this that the um, inbreeding would be 0.5 or 1 fourth, and they're the same across all the individuals. But when we measure this with runs of homozygosity, the genetic COI can vary um, a little bit across all of the individuals, and that is due to that recombination um, that we just spoke about. But sometimes, it, pedigrees are incomplete and we can be missing information. So if we take the same example, but instead of it being half siblings, we find out that the fathers of these individuals are actually full siblings. Um, so instead of it being a half sibling mating, it's a cryptic three quarter sibling mating. Now, because the pedigree is incomplete, it would still say that these individuals um, have a COI of 0.25. But when measured with our runs of homozygosity, these are much higher. Um, and so the pedigree COIs become much more inaccurate as we have inbreeding. And that takes us to our second take home point, which is that pedigrees can be incomplete or have errors and therefore can lead to large underestimation of COI. Uh, genetic COI is the direct measurement of realized inbreeding. Now, all the dogs that go through the Embark pipeline are measured for genetic COI, 
So here we have the distributions of genetic COI uh, across 11 different breeds. They're listed at the bottom on the x-axis, and then the y-axis lists the genetic COI values. Now, there are two points I want to make here. Uh, the first is that there is variation within a breed. So, for example, the Doberman Pinscher, um, you can have as low as almost 0.25 COI um, and as high as 0.6, but the vast majority are within 5 to 10% of the median COI for that breed. So it's fairly consistent. Um, the second point is that there's variation across breeds. So Doberman Pinscher and Bulldog have uh, median COIs around 0.4 or 40%, whereas the Siberian Husky and Poodle um, have median COIs of about 20%. The second way we can look at inbreeding is looking at um, how inbreeding has accrued over time. So conceptually, um, these runs of homozygosity are measured, um, but over time as inbreeding accrues over generations, these lengths of ROH or runs of homozygosity are broken up um, and become smaller due to recombination and that shuffling of the DNA. So these longer runs of homozygosity segments reflect more recent inbreeding, while shorter segments of um, ROH reflect older inbreeding. And we can look at the lengths of um, runs of homozygosity across different breeds, and that's what we do. You see the different breeds in um, different color lines in the center. The length of runs of homozygosity on the bottom from long to short as you look right and then the fraction of the genome that is in ROH on the y-axis. And the slope will be important for interpreting this slide. So the steeper the slope um, means that the faster this breeding, inbreeding has accrued in that breed. Um, so let us take an example really quick of the Doberman Pinscher in orange and the Bulldog in red. And you'll notice that the Doberman Pinscher slope is much higher than that of the Bulldog. Um, and this makes sense based off the biology um, or the breeding history that we know about these dogs. For example, the Doberman Pinscher accrued much of its inbreeding within the last century, while the Bulldog um, accrued its inbreeding in the 1830s when bull baiting was banned and there was a um, dramatic decrease in demand for the dog, and therefore they went through a severe bottleneck. The third way we can look at how it, inbreeding is distributed in breeds is looking at inbreeding or runs of homozygosity um, density. So what we do within a breed is we stack up all the individuals' runs of homozygosity on top of each other, and the density, um, high density areas of runs of homozygosity in yellow, so areas where there are a lot of individuals with um, runs of homozygosity in that location compared to the dark blue, which have low frequency of runs of homozygosity in the breed. Um, and what's interesting here is that we found that the bulldog at chromosome 32 at the locus BMP3, which encodes or is associated with brachiocephaly, the short snouts, um, has a high density of runs of homozygosity at that location. Um, similarly, we see this in poodles on chromosome 13 at the locus RSPO2, which encodes furnishings. Um, but an important thing to note here is that it's not just at those loci uh, where we see these high, high densities, but also the areas immediately next to them or around them um, compared to when we look further out to the right where it's much darker blue. And what's happening is something that we call linkage. Um, so because these areas are physically close to the areas that are selected for, they are brought with them um, or they are considered linked with these, these loci. Um, um, this can also be called hitchhiking as well, in which these things are kind of hitchhike along when you're selecting for a certain trait or condition. Um, and that's not itself bad, especially if those areas don't encode for anything. But there are situations where we have unintended consequences 
or something um, is encoded and we um, inadvertently select for it when selecting for something like brachiocephaly. And a prime example of this is in Dalmatians for the HUU, um, which encodes a uric acid defect in Dalmatians. Um, so essentially what happens is that they get bladder stones, um, which are very painful and hard to treat and not usually requires uh, surgery and, and it can be um, quite hard on the owners and the dogs themselves. And how this happened in Dalmatians is that they, um, we were selecting upon spotting for Dalmatians, but the HUU gene was located closely to the spotting genes and was inadvertently selected for um, at the same time we were selecting on spotting. And that takes us to our third take home point, that historical inbreeding via strong artificial selection during preformation, so that selection for certain traits has led to an increased frequency of deleterious or harmful mutations in many dog breeds. Now, thus far, we've talked a little bit of mostly about simple traits where there's one gene with a certain genotype. And if you have that genotype, then you get that phenotype or that trait that you can see. Okay, so thus far, we've talked mostly about simple traits um, in which one gene or one genotype means that you have one phenotype or physical trait that you can see. But for the most part, phenotypes are a combination of genotype and environment. In the most simplest um, description of a lot of what we've spoken about today, these genotypes have a 100% effect or 100% or uh, contribution to the resulting phenotype. So if you have that allele or that certain genotype, then you will have that phenotype. But effect sizes can be smaller. So instead of if you have that genotype, you will have that phenotype. It can instead be if you have that genotype, you have an increased risk or increased chance of a given phenotype. Now, this becomes much more complex when we're talking about polygenic traits um, in which many different genes contribute to a certain phenotype. And often each gene has its own effect size um, and con own contribution towards the resulting phenotype. And at each gene, um, there can be different inheritance patterns or different dominance patterns that accumulate into the resulting phenotype. And I want you to keep that in mind as we move into the next section. So the first thing I wanna talk about is inbreeding depression. Um, this is the reduced survival and fertility of the offspring of related individuals. And this happens when we have harmful or deleterious mutations at these genes uh, that underlie these complex traits. And one way we can look at this, because it is a complex trait and kind of hard to disentangle, is we can correlate DOI against a given trait of interest. So for example, on this trait, we are correlating COI against litter size. Um, and what we would expect is that as dogs become more inbred, they have smaller litter sizes. And that is exactly what we found um, in collaboration with the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study at Morris Annal Foundation. We found that as CUI increased, that we found smaller um, mean number of puppies in the litter. And what it came out to is approximately for every 10% increase in genetic COI, we saw one fewer puppy in litter. We can also correlate COI with things like lifespan, um, in this study out of Adam's lab at Cornell, they looked at both males and females um, and compared inbred lines for inbred males versus outbred males, and the same for females in, in panel C here. And what, we, what they found is that outbred males and females lived longer lives, statistically significant longer lives, than their inbred counterparts. So they found that COI um, is in indeed an important predictor for lifespan. 
And we're exploring this a little bit more here at Embark through the annual health survey um, that we put out every year on your Embark profiles. Where we, um, and we have recorded data for approximately 1,684 1, dogs. And we asked the question, does COI predict lifespan? And we accounted for covariates such as age, weight, sex, and neuter status. And what we found is, yes, it does um, predict COI. And we found an average two-year difference in lifespan between a COI of zero and 50%. So essentially, with higher COI values, you're seeing shorter lifespans of your dog. We also wanted to look at health conditions um, through this annual health survey, and we looked at approximately 28,000 dogs, and we wanted to know, does COI predict the owner-reported health condition? And again, we wanted to account for covariates that could influence or bias our data, uh, such as age, weight, sex, neuter status, and exercise. And our results found that for um, as a coefficient of inbreeding increased here on the x-axis, that the probability of finding a poor, fair, or good, any non-excellent health condition increased as inbreeding increased. Whereas health can, probability of a healthy or excellent health outcome decreased as coefficient of inbreeding increased. So COI is positively correlated with the probability that an owner reports a dog in non-excellent health. Similarly, we wanted to look at diagnoses of health conditions. So we looked at uh, owner-reported health information for greater than 30,000 dogs. And we wanted to know, does COI predict odds of having been diagnosed, and that's through a vet, with a broad range of diseases? And again, similarly, we accounted for covariates, age, weight, sex, neuter status, and exercise. And we looked at 16 different categories of disease uh, conditions. And we found, again, that COI is positively correlated with the probability of being diagnosed with any of these types of conditions. So our fourth take home is that inbreeding is a significant predictor of longevity, overall health, and likelihood of being been diagnosed with a range of complex diseases. Now to switch gears a little bit into how we can pragmatically preserve diversity through breeding, there's two main questions or concerns that come up. One, can small genetic panels such as microsatellites be used to maintain genetic diversity? And can loss of genetic diversity be slowed by minimizing inbreeding in individual dogs? We wanted to ask, answer this first question um, through a simulation study. Um, and what we did was we compared the efficacy of using a microsatellite panel or a small genetic panel compared to a null model of, of just random mating across the breed. So essentially, does using a microsatellite work better than doing no planning? And so I don't want to, you to get uh, too overwhelmed by this, this figure. You just focus on the bottom panel here. Um, and what you're looking at are these dots with the, the color distributions around them. And the more negative those are, the better microsatellites performed when preserving genetic diversity. When it's at zero, it was essentially no different than um, random mating. So if we focus on this yellow dot or yellow distribution dot, um, microsatellites do a really good job outperforming random mating. But as we move away from that spot um, in the genome where that microsatellite is located and move away towards these green dots, and distributions, we see that it becomes quickly no different than random inbreeding. So genetic diversity can only be preserved where it's measured. And unfortunately, microsatellite panels only effectively cover 5% of the genome. 
When we look at the same results when using SNPs or genome-wide panels, um, we see that there are negative values consistently um, across all of these different categories. So as we move away from that location on the microsatellite, we are still outperforming random mating um, even as we move away. So Genome-wide data provides a uniform preservation of diversity. And that leads us to our fifth take home, which is genome-wide genetic panels are necessary to preserve genetic variation across the entire genome in our breeding panels or breeding programs. So I'm gonna just summarize some of the take home points that we've gotten thus far before I move on to how we are going to do, bring this home and make this a, a practice in our breeding uh, pairs in the future. First, um, pedigree-based COI does not account for specific genetic recombination events within a dog's pedigree. Pedigrees can be incomplete and therefore lead to large underestimation of COI. And genetic COI is a direct measurement of realized inbreeding. Historical inbreeding, or that selection for certain traits when breeding, when forming these breeds, has led to an increased frequency of deleterious mutations in many dog breeds. Inbreeding is a significant predictor of longevity, overall health, and likelihood of being diagnosed with a range of complex diseases. And lastly, genome-wide genetic panels are necessary to preserve genetic diversity across the entire genome in a breeding program. Now you might be asking, these are all well and good as a breeder, um, but how do I then take this home and apply it to my, my dogs? Um, and so we have two rules of thumb um, that you can follow based off conservation genetic theory and practice. The first is to breed pairs with the lowest mean kinship or the lowest expected COI values. And the second is to breed as many different pairs as you can. You want to avoid the popular sire effect as much as you can. And I'm going to illustrate why that is um, in this diagram to the right. So let's say we take a breed club and a population of dogs and we follow these rules into the next generation. And what you can see is it looks the composition of this, these dogs in this new population looks very much similar to the original, where we have all different uh, colored lineages, um, and that diversity and variation is preserved. But if we allow for a popular sire effect where one or a few individuals are siring more, um, more litters than you would expect, and you can get something a little bit like this, where there's an overrepresentation of a certain lineage here, the yellow lineage, um, and that is at the loss of other uh, variation or lineages, such as the pink and the light blue. Um, so not only are we losing out on genetic variation, but now these individuals are much more related to each other as a whole, um, and that increases inbreeding overall in the whole population. Now, I respect that this can definitely be a challenge, especially in companion animal breeding. So Embari is not going to leave you out um, in the cold. We have a new tool that you guys can use, which uh, we're really excited about. It's called uh, the Pair Predictor. It's available to 48 breeds and eight designer breeds. And what you can do is you can take two dogs, such as Baxter and Luna here, um, and it will give you the expected litter COI um, here at the bottom. And so what you can do to use this for um, diversity preservation is you can compare a list of potential sires and use our pair checker and choose the sire with the lowest expected COI. Now, I also understand um, that COI is not the only um, factor when making these decisions. There's also genetic health conditions, and pair predictor also includes some guidance on that in the right above expected COI. Now to just summarize all the things that you can do as a breeder going forth, um, you can use available genetic tests and services to avoid unnecessary breeding, inbreeding in litters today. So you can use that ECOI tool in Pair Predictor. 
you can test mutations known to associate with health risk and avoid pairings that would lead to at-risk litters. And again, you can partially use the pair predictor and that health conditions tab. At the breed and population level, you want to keep as many breeding animals of both sexes in the gene pool as possible. So you want to really avoid that um, popular sire effect. And lastly, um, as our Embark customers and research partners, you can collaborate with us in research by participating in any of our research surveys, um, such as the annual health survey. And with that, I will thank you all for listening in. I want to also especially thank Morris Animal Foundation, Doberman Diversity Project, and the Embark customers. We really consider our citizen scientists, and I will take any questions. All right, and we are live with our, our Q&A with Dr. Sam Hauser. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. So as we, as we mentioned in the introduction, Dr. Hauser is a senior scientist at Embark, and your work is crucial to supporting our overall mission of improving the health and longevity of dogs. Um, and as you talk about in your presentation, um, a lot of Embark's work with breeders has to do with understanding the importance and impact of genetic health and how it can be applied to breeding programs and selecting breeding pairs. So really excited to kind of dig into this topic more with you and, and ask you a few questions. Um, we have a number of questions from the audience that have come in. We certainly won't be able to answer them all, but as a reminder, as we've shared in other presentations, anything we can't answer live, you can ask over in the Embark booth, and we have a number of experts there to respond to your questions. Um, so to kick it off, Dr. Hauser, do you want to just take maybe, you know, 20, 30 seconds, just give us a little um, insight into how you got into this this field in the first place? What, what led you to be passionate about this research? Yeah, um, so I think like most of us, my love for dogs started at home growing up. Um, but also growing up, I was really fortunate in um, having an aunt and a godmother who was involved in dog showing and training and judging for Australian Shepherds, ASCA. Um, and since then, that love of, of dogs and animals grew. And once I got into college, I fell in love with wildlife biology through wolves and went into wildlife and came all, kind of full circle back to dogs right now um, and looking into helping dogs be the healthiest and happiest they can be. That's great. That's great. Well, we're glad to have you here at Embark. And um, let's jump into some of these audience submitted questions. So. First one I see, what are the effects of breeding a dog with a high COI to a dog with a low COI? Would COI cause you to retire a dog from your program? Yeah, um, so a good way of thinking of breeding two dogs with high COI isn't so much considering the COI of the two dogs, but their expected COI, so you could use pair checker. Um, another way to think about it is the relatedness of the two um, dogs to breed. And that will out that will um, produce the the COI of that litter because um, sometimes you can have two dogs with low COI and their litter COI ends up being higher just due to how those areas of homozygosity match up. Um, and I wouldn't say COI should cause you to retire a dog from your program. Um, one of the really important things to remember um, as you try to increase or preserve genetic diversity in your program is not to omit dogs um, as much as possible. Um, so if it has a high COI and it's a really great dog, otherwise maybe you just uh, need to manage that proactively by, by um, using pair checker and things like that to, to um, minimize the expected COI of that, that resulting litter. Got it. And there's been several questions about what what makes for a good COI score um, or, you know, or a bad COI score? There's a few questions about what's the ideal range for a breeding pair. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? And I think the added context is if this is a large breed population or a small breed population, how does that influence your answer? Yeah. Um, so generally, obviously, we want as low COI as possible. Um, but within the context of a breed, you want to 
look at the average COI values for that breed and um, and also try to take the that list of potential sires from your population or your breed and try and minimize um, the COI of that resulting letter is the best method. Um, I know that's easier said than done, uh, and I know COI is one of many factors considered when choosing a breeding pair. Um, so I think COI is something is one factor, um, and you want to manage for it. Um, but don't get necessarily scared away from breeding a dog just because their COI is high um, relative to mixed breed dogs, for example. Sure, sure. It sounds like what you're saying is that as you consider a given breeding pair, look at is the projected genetic COI of the puppies lower than the individual of the sire and dam, is that right? Um, yes, but also, um, lower than other potential pairs you can make and on the lower side of the population. So that average COI value um, that we provide on Pair Checker is for all of the dogs in that breed um, that we've tested at Embark. Got it, got it. So as you look at this specific um, topic, you know, assessing the pro projected COI of various, you know, litters among different breeding pairs, there's a question, do you provide tools for managing sustainable breeding of dogs and inbreeding coefficients? Uh, this is a nice a nice call out. The, the answer is yes. We did recently roll out what we call um, Parachecker, um, which is a tool that for any tested dogs on your Embark profile, you can assess the projected COI of the of the litter of any projected pairing, as well as look at the um, the whether or not genetic health conditions will be inherited by the offspring. Um, so great question, and yes, we provide tools for doing so. Um, another question here, though, with closed stud books, won't repeated outcrossing result in homozygosity across the breed such that every breeding becomes inbreeding eventually? Can you speak to that? Yeah, um, and I think this, this speaks to a bigger uh, topic in kind of conservation genetics and, and breeding in purebred dogs is that any closed population is going to become um, progressively more inbred. It's a bottleneck. Um, and if you don't have incoming genetic variation, um, you, you will not gain any genetic variation. You can only lose it. What's important when considering breeding is the rate and how severe that COI is increasing, that inbreeding is increasing within a population. OK. Um, so let's see, I'm just looking at some of these questions. Um, what possible tools are available to identify diversity pockets within a population uh, with raw SNP data? Going by lowest expected COI won't necessarily preserve those diversity subpopulations. Yeah, this is a really great question and a difficult question uh, to address in that um, a lot of breeding decisions are not done at a population level, per se. They're done at the breeder level and who they can get in contact with, who they have good relationships with, um, who's close enough to actually breed the two dogs. Um, so while I agree, it would be really great to um, look at this and manage it from a population level and get all those subpopulations um, involved. I also understand that that might not be possible or practical in a lot of breeding situations. Um, so currently, Embark doesn't necessarily have tools for us to, to look at that, um, but it would be a really great collaboration if anyone wants to work at a population level. I would love that. Yeah, I think that's the challenge of, of you know, breeding dogs as opposed to like managing wildlife populations. Yeah. You, can't, you can't holistically control the various, you know, breeding pair decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two questions here related to the same topic. I'll try to kind of articulate them both together, but I think generally breeders might have a, a dog that they want to breed that is clear of known genetic health conditions and, and generally has all the other attributes they want from physical appearance and traits to temperament. But breeding that dog would not be the best choice regarding the, purely by looking at COI, you know, the, the mm -hmm. offspring of that dog. Um, and then the kind of related question is breeders will line breed or purposefully inbreed in order to ensure a particular outcome in terms of, of traits or appearance. Um, 
you know, breeding for phenotype as opposed to breeding for genetic diversity. So basically, how do you how do you reconcile these two things? If increased genetic diversity is good for health, but breeders are trying to produce dogs that look and act a certain way, you know, how right. do you do you kind of incorporate those two those two uh, you know topics? Yeah, it's it's hard. It's a hard balance to to reach. I will absolutely admit that. Um, I have likened making breeding decisions to having red tape on the wall um, and trying and feeling a little bit crazy in that regard. Um, but I think it, it's something that needs to be balanced along with other things. Um, I think you don't necessarily want to omit any dog purely because of COI. Those That COI can be decreased over time through the, the methods we've already outlined. Um, and if it is a phenotypically healthy dog, I wouldn't say you should take a dog out of this out of your breeding population just because of COI. And the same would go for a dog um, that might be at risk for something. You don't want to take it out. Um, the idea of preserving genetic variation is wanting to keep all of the dogs um, and all that genetic variation as much as possible within a population. Mm-hmm. Um, and those things can be managed. Um, through selective breeding. Um, and, and sorry, what was the second part of that question? Well, I think I think that was broadly broadly it is just sort of balancing okay. the, the factors. I mean, I, yeah. I think the other point you might be making, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think part of the discussion is do you have a long-term or short-term outlook? Because while while inbreeding to produce dogs of a certain trait or phenotype in the short term may not have any other consequences. In the longer term, um, and I think you can speak to this much better than I can, lower genetic COI leads to longer lifespans and more puppies per litter on average. So is that, can you just comment on that a little bit? Like if you're a breeder who's intending to have generation after generation in the coming years, you know, perhaps that longer term outlook influences how you think about genetic COI. Yeah, absolutely. So, so as I, I spoke about a little bit in the presentation, was that with higher CUIs, you have lower litter sizes. So, um, even on the short term, you might want to have a higher COI. Um, but long term, if you want to um, increase the population and preserve a, a breed um, and have long-standing um, sustainability of a breed in the world. Uh, you'll want to preserve things like reproductive output and the ability to reproduce. Um, and as COI and litter size um, become more maladaptive, that can that that's obviously not great for the population. Um, the same is for lifespan, as I spoke a, lo- a, bi- a little bit about um, in that study. But we're actually going to embark, uh, no, a little bit of pun intended, on um, a COI and uh, lifespan project here at Embark in in the future. So that'll be really exciting. It's great. So we're we're almost out of time, but there's a question. If you could answer it in in 20 seconds or less, because I want to get it in. Um, Can you elaborate on why micro satellite analysis is inferior to genome wide SNP based panel? Is this because of the number of markers and distribution? Yeah. Um, The short Short and, short and dirty of it is you can only preserve what you know about, um, and microsatellites only represent a very small amount of the genome. So you'll preserve the genetic variation at the, that small percentage of the genome, but you won't know what is going on and you won't be able to preserve DNA variation across the entire genome. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's many other questions we didn't get to, but again, please pose these over in the Embark booth as, as our team can continue answering via chat. Uh, Dr. Hauser, thank you again for your presentation. Really informative, really important to you know, canine health overall and educating breeders and veterinarians. So um, thank you again for that. And uh, for our general audience, the next session start in just one minute. There are two options. One is by Dr. Marty Greer. Uh, incorporating canine genetic testing into patient health planning and treatment, and the other by Dr. Brenda Bonnet, speaking on breeding healthy puppies and sustaining your breed, the goal and how we get there. So we will see you in one of those two sessions, and thank you again.